The scholar Robert Hoyland looked at historical sources outside of Islam and found something very interesting. There is no mention of a holy book used by the followers of Muhammad before 719 AD. Let's take a look. Dr. J, welcome back. Yeah, uh, and it's, we do need to give lip service to Robert Hoyland, and we need to thank him for all the great work he has done. He has been quoted right, left, and center for obvious reasons, because he does what, what the Muslims should have done. And that is, you need to, if, since you don't have anything, you admit you don't have anything for the first two centuries. Uh, for, for 200 years, you have nothing. If you have nothing, then why don't you go and find out what is there? And there's a reason why you have nothing, because the Abbasids have destroyed it all. So why don't you go to those things that the Abbasids didn't have control over? Why don't you go to those who were there in situ, who are actually being impacted by these Muslims, like John of Damascus, like Al-Kindi, like Abraham from Tiberias? These are the guys who are living in the, underneath the authority of these Arabs who call themselves Ishmaelites, who later called themselves Muslims. They were being impacted, and then they were writing, and those their writings don't get destroyed. They're still wholesale. They're still with us today. Why don't you see what they say? And that's what he did. He just went all over from the 7th century. He wasn't interested in the 9th and 10th century. He had already, like I have and you have, we've already thrown that out as too late and too far north. And he said, let's see what they're saying. And there's some little tidbits that I just like to introduce that have come up that actually support what we're talking about. Right. One of the things, and Shoemaker mentions this in his book, and that's why Shoemaker gives him a lot of credit. And, and, and he, he refers to this book. He says, in this more than 870-page volume uh, that was published in 1997, in, in the last century. Mm -hmm. So it's not new. It's been all around for over 20 years. Hoyland catalogs over 130 non-Islamic sources that make reference to the religious movement founded. Now, here's where Schumacher should have, have founded by Muhammad. No, nowhere is our, do any of these uh, references say Muhammad. That is true. I mean, I looked at him. I, I'm surprised that he would say that. It did talk about a religious person or a leader, but it not did not give a name. And one of my criticisms is what Hoyland does do. He calls them Muslims and he calls Muhammad Muhammad. No, there's no reference in any of these to a man named Muhammad. Now, there you are going to see the, uh, the, he and Peter. Uh, I forget the name of there's there's one reference, uh, not Sabaeus. Uh, it's the Presbyter, Thomas the Presbyter, does use the word Muhammad, but it's written in the ninth century. The nerd, that is obvious that in the ninth century, that yeah, yeah, we're talking about early. I mean, later we know why it was used because it's been developed already. Exactly, and that's why Al Kindi yeah. uses Muhammad yeah. because he's yeah. there when Muhammad was well known. He's using the word Muslim because they were Muslims at that time. But anybody writing in the seventh century from documents in the seventh century don't use the word Muhammad and they don't use the word Muslim. So Hoyland needs to be careful because he's not quoting it correctly when he's referring to it. Even Shoemaker makes this mistake, though that name is not used. Is what I say at various stages in its early history. Around 60 of these witnesses were written during the first Islamic century. That means from 622 to 719. Now, up to 719, according to Hoyland, there is no reference to the Quran. Let's see the quote. None of these first century witnesses so much as mentions any sort of sacred writing used in any capacity at all by Muhammad's followers. This has nothing short of incredible. And this is a shoemaker saying this. This is nothing short of incredible if as many would suppose that the Quran was already collected by 650. Everybody would have known about it. Yeah. Especially if it had been standardized in a canonical form and was believed by Muhammad's followers to be direct revelation from their God. This is solid evidence that is, that is deeply problematic for accepting the canonical narrative of a Sunni Noldekian Shwalian paradigm evidence that has accordingly been widely ignored by Western scholars. Right, and, and this would prove, obviously, there was no such thing as a known book. That mean it was in the process of being developed. That's right. And then he goes to Hoyland to say, well, what does Hoyland say is the first reference to this Uthmanic recension? And the first reference, the earliest source for the Uthmanic collection is not till Al-Zuri talks about it. Look at the date, 742. That's the mid 8th century. That's 100 years after That's the a... alleged uh, reign of Uthman. Exactly. It is exactly 100 years after the reign of yeah. Uthman. Yeah. Well, well, Uthman starts in, in 644, so just two years earlier, shy yeah. of that. But can you see, this is enormous. Why has no one brought this up? And then here it says, here's, he goes back, and, and, and this he then quotes Nikolai Sinai. 
Yet both the letter of Leo III and John of Damascus are just as old, if not older, as the alternative account of the Quran's origin and related by Saif ibn Mumar, neither of which describe any Uthmanic codex. So these are things we need to look at. These are things we need to hear. And I'm thankful that Shoemaker is bringing these up and saying these are important because these are nuggets that give us a timeline. He continues on and he talks about the 7th century Jew or Christian knew nothing about this Quran, this book. And this is what Shoemaker says. It is worth emphasizing that according to, in the strongest terms, that according to Hoyland, that prior to John of Damascus and the letter of Leo III, those are both 8th century, which appeared in the, to be roughly contemporary works from the, the, the well, 8th century, no writer, Christian or otherwise, shows any awareness at all that Muhammad's followers had his sacred book of their own. In fact, they don't even show that, that there's Muhammad's followers or Muhammad. This long silence should certainly give us pause, and it raises significant questions about the history and status of the Quran during the first Islamic century. The Jews and Christians of late antiquity were peoples for whom the authority, the sacred book was paramount. Surely they would have been curious and inquisitive to learn whether these newly arrived Abrahamic monotheists had a scripture of their own, and yet they show complete ignorance of any distinctive corpus of scripture claimed by Muhammad's followers until the early 8th century. And this is powerful, by the way. Huge, huge. Yeah. If this is the greatest book in the history of mankind, if this is the book that's, that, that corrects this book and it supersedes this book, then why did nobody know about it? And if this is the greatest man ever sent by God to transform the universe, why wouldn't anybody make reference to him? Yeah, yeah. Hoyland continues on and talks about the fact that these early Christian writers dispute the standard Islamic narrative. Leo III, John of Damascus, Abraham, and Al-Kindi, the, all these sources, all of which are either contemporary or before Al-Buhari sources where we get about the Quran. Remember, it's Al-Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 509. 204 years later. Uh, where, where we get all this material in 100 years later, or in this case, 40 years later. It is clear that the Uthmanic tradition for the creation of the Quran is much later and based only on Isnats. Isnats are a list of names of which nothing is written. It's all oral tradition, mm -hmm. which are nothing more than, a, uh, he just goes on and says, nothing more than a list of names, while these four sources are written sources predating those of Al-Buhari. Fascinating. And this is why we need to have Robert Hoyland. Robert Hoyland doesn't really come to any conclusions on it. He just puts out the material there for us to deal with it. Like Shoemaker any scholar should it, do. And he's right? saying, we've got to deal with it. We've got to come to conclusions. And that's what we're doing as well. Exactly. I mean, Robert Hoyland is saying, here's my evidence. Tell me what you make out of it. Well, we're telling him what we make out of it. Yeah. And, you know, you have to understand also uh, his position, where he's at. He has to be careful as well. So I think Robert Hoyland did an excellent job for all of us just by presenting this evidence. Yeah. Good stuff. Excellent. So what are we going to talk about next time? We're then now finally going to get into the Quranic manuscripts. Wonderful. And I can't wait, of course, because it's a fascinating topic. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.